think the first, my first encounter was with a friend ZX Spectrum. Um, but as, a, as an academic, probably, <laughs> what I was mostly interested in was word processing. So, for example, I'd uh, written a, a thesis which uh, started with um, uh, typing out and getting carbon copies and having to, you know, infinitely kind of correct them uh, when I wrote a master's thesis. Uh, when I then moved on to a PhD, I had a typist who had an electronic golf ball uh, typewriter, which of course was a great advance, and I got special permission uh, from my college to Xerox copies uh, rather than relying on carbon copies. So my entree, I suppose, into computing was very much through the word processing function. That was what was uh, important to me. Um, when it came to um, helping other students uh, then write their theses uh, in the 1980s, we had in college the research machines 380Z, uh, which fed out to a dot matrix printer, which wasn't very elegant, but um, at least was a way of being able to store and to edit uh, the text that you wrote instead of having to get a typist to completely retype uh, the text. Um, so I would like to put in a word for the 380Z. <laughs> um, this was a college in Oxford, and Research Machines was our local uh, equivalent, if you like, of the uh, Acorn um, company in Cambridge. And um, so a lot of the schools did, in fact, uh, use the 380Z, but we made a lot of use of it in, uh, in, in college, and both for um, students writing their theses and also for uh, administration. Um, so I was working in a college of education in uh, Oxford at the time, Westminster College, training teachers again for primary uh, teaching, and I had, was lucky enough to um, have a secondment to work in a local primary school in Ensham in 1984-1985 uh, when I found myself with what we then called Upper Juniors, now Year 6, Year 5 and Year 6, um, teaching my enthusiasm, which was history, and the BBC Doomsday Project uh, was launched. Now, um, I found this a little bit scary at the time, to be honest, because uh, we had a BBC uh, computer in the classroom which uh, required all the programming to be loaded through um, a cassette machine and it only required uh, one of the children to press the wrong key on the keyboard and you'd lost the program and had to start again. Um, that, that was a, a problem in my experience. But um, the BBC Doomsday Project was launched uh, with the idea to celebrate the 900th anniversary uh, of uh, the Doomsday Book. And uh, we were with our children in the primary school uh, to explore the local area and to record the history of our uh, local area and the way it looked and the way it worked and the way people were uh, 900 years on from doomsday. So uh, from my point of view as a historian, the great thing was being able to get outside the classroom and to be taking the children to visit, for example, the local sewerage works, you know, which hadn't been on the curriculum before. Um, but going and talking to people about the work they were doing, uh, recording the way in which uh, people were employed in the local community, uh, recording the houses that they were living in. And what was very special about this, I think, was that the children had a sense that they were doing something that was part of a national project and they were doing something that was real, that was going to be, their data was going to be fed into the computer and was going to be read by people uh, 
across the country. Um, and not only that, but their data, what they wrote about their village, was going to be read by people in perhaps 800 and 900 years' time. Um, now, the doomsday data was all recorded on uh, a, a video disk system, which was very experimental at the time, which I think, ironically, only lasted a few years. But uh, I believe the data has been rescued so that um, the, the children can be fairly confident that their belief that what they wrote uh, and the photographs that they took would be still available in hundreds of years' time. That was really, I think, the, one of the essential ingredients, that the, the computer was the way, obviously, of harnessing the data and feeding it into a, a national database. Um, but uh, for the children, it was that sense of speaking to an audience that was much wider than the audience normally for their work, uh, what they wrote in their books would be looked at by me um, and commented on. It may be looked at by their parents, but it went no further. And it was that idea of doing something that was um, talking to a wider audience. Also, by doing it for the BBC, there was this sense that they were um, producing something real. Um, the BBC as a national broadcaster, they were engaged in something that was absolutely uh, real and was going to result in a kind of tangible product. So I'd uh, shown an interest in the mid-1980s in the Doomsday Project and working with children on the BBC Acorn. And when I moved on to Leicestershire and uh, saw a job advertised in, in a primary school in Leicester, um, I went along uh, to the interview armed with uh, my experiences of having worked with the BBC Acorn and I'd written my application for the job on a word processor. <laughs> so at interview the head teacher said to me, oh you're clearly an expert in computers, you know, you've word processed your application, you've done a bit on the Doomsday Project, um, would you like to uh, coordinate the computing <laughs> in the school? And uh, I said, well, I hardly think, you know, I'm qualified for that. But if it's a condition of the job, I'd like the job and I'll do it. Uh, so I found myself uh, as the IT coordinator in quite a large primary school. Um, personally, I felt that there were other teachers who knew a lot more about computing and were more skilled at using the computer than I was. Um, but they seemed to be uh, quite happy that I should, in consultation with the rest of the staff, be the person who uh, helped to make decisions. One of the decisions that we had to make was whether we would use um, the BBC computers in school or whether we would use research machines. Um, and I'd had experiences of both. Um, the research machines now available for schools was the RM Nimbus, which I think was offering uh, a lot more possibilities. Um, for example, it had a colour screen uh, than the 380Z on which I'd um, helped students write their theses in, in college. And um, so I went for uh, research machines. I thought that was a more attractive option um, than, than the BBC. Um, but within the local education authority, we did have uh, a teacher's centre uh, for information technology and we had an advisor within the local education authority who was responsible for uh, computing and IT. And um, they were very useful uh, in helping me to make the decision. Um, the local authority in this particular instance didn't insist on one kind of computer or the other. They left the decision to the school, but they were there to give us guidance. I think in some local authorities, um, the authority as a whole um, would opt for, for one kind or the other. Um, but uh, So although I felt 
technically unqualified to do the job, I was, I suppose, able to consult with people and to weigh up pros and cons of the, you know, the advantages in the classroom for the curriculum and for children. What I'm looking at here um, is a turtle. And uh, the turtle came into my life when uh, I went, uh, was appointed, much to my surprise, um, to be IT coordinator at a primary school in uh, Leicester City in um, 1988. Um, I was very surprised because I think there were other people on the staff of this large primary school who knew a lot more about computers than I did, but um, nobody wanted to do the job <laughs> and uh, apparently I knew how to use a word processor. Um, so I was responsible for um, coordinating people's needs and um, making decisions with the head teacher about the sort of equipment uh, that was required. Fortunately, we had from the local education authority a very good advisor and an IT centre uh, who could recommend kit. And this was one of the pieces of kit that was uh, recommended, so we acquired one of these um, to the great delight and enjoyment of children. This turtle is essentially a robot. Um, it moves around on the floor, so we would clear a space in the uh, middle of the classroom. And on a BBC computer, uh, the children would write programs uh, to get the turtle to move in particular directions. I think at that time, the educational thinking was probably that children needed to, even young children, needed to understand the programme and to be able to write a simple programme. Um, but what was exciting, I think, to me in looking at the children's responses was that the computer was not just doing something on the screen, but it was making an object move in time and space around them. And that, to me, seemed to be the, you know, the great sort of educational value, that they were seeing how uh, the computer could be applied to making something move, which I guess we would call robotics. Basically, the turtle was the nearest it came probably to being uh, computing per se, um, because at that stage we were quite focused on writing programs. So, how does the computer work? Not open it up and have a look at the component parts, but what is the software actually doing? And uh, getting children to understand what, well, how was a program written? Uh, and the turtle was certainly an aid in, in doing that. So they were writing simple programs to um, control the turtle. Well, at uh, some stage, I think we thought as primary teachers that uh, children were using these um, magic boxes but had no idea of what was really going on inside. Um, and as a teacher of history, I used to bring in old objects into the classroom for children to have a look at and play with. Um, and one of the things that I happened to have was an old radio. Um, so this was probably uh, perhaps a Philips radio from uh, the wartime years. And um, I took it in, I found it in my attic, probably belonged to my parents years ago. And uh, we took the radio apart and looked inside and we saw all these big valves. Um, so talking to my colleagues, we thought, well, you know, why don't we take a computer apart and see what, what's inside? Um, so we unscrewed the top of the BBC acorn and actually um, looked inside and identified one or two bits and pieces. Um, and it was very interesting to actually, for the children visually, to make the comparison between uh, the um, transistors and um, small components, microchips in one machine and the old valves that were operating my uh, 1930s radio. Um, so that was uh, 
perhaps a rather unconventional approach to uh, the study of computing in school, but I don't think I was the only person uh, who was doing that. <laughs> um, and there was certainly a use for redundant computers as you upgraded. You know, you could certainly take apart the old ones freely and um, pull them apart and look at, uh, look at what, you know, what, what was there, yeah, yeah. We did, of course, have a, an IT centre, and um, it was a teacher's centre, and we could take equipment to them uh, to be prepared. Um, but, you know, from time to time, I did have to improvise with my colleagues, and um, uh, as a very um, technically illiterate person, <laughs> I think the sorts of things that, uh, that, uh, that I did on the whole were, were, were pretty crude. Um, but uh, we would, in fact, have the, the technical support from the local education authority. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a very literary sort of person, and my history uh, was concerned largely with reading books and um, with telling stories, if you like, through words. Um, but one of the things that I was particularly aware of during the um, late 1970s and then on into the 1980s was that many historians thought that the benefit of the computer was going to be able to uh, use statistical evidence. Uh, so, for example, one of my interests was the way in the past people had become literate. People had numbers of people had learned to read. Uh, we went from through the 19th century, say, from you know a period when a very small percentage of the population were literate, through education, through schooling, to the late 19th century when uh, you know virtually 90 percent and more of the population. Uh, became literate. Now, what historians, my fellow historians, were very interested in was gathering the statistics for that. You could gather statistics from um, census records, you could gather statistics from um, marriage certificates that people had signed. And so their great uh, ambition um, for uh, the, the computer and what the computer would do would be to enable us to produce very sophisticated statistical accounts of history. What occurred to me over the 1990s and into the 21st century was that the um, power of the computer in processing statistics began to have a negative effect uh, on the ways in which we worked in higher education and in schools. And I think the reason was this, was that uh, the possibility of collecting and processing so much data about, for example, the performance of children in school was seized on by the government as a way of holding schools to account for their performance. Um, the problem, to my mind, was that statistics could only measure certain kinds of achievements by children and by schools, which could be reduced to simple numbers. Um, teachers in primary school, teachers in higher education, would like to measure what they achieve through the intellectual and emotional development of individuals. Um, and yet the uh, statistical data would be very much in terms of a limited range of skills um, or students' performances on tests. And uh, there is a serious concern, I think, that's uh, arisen in the teaching profession that what happens then is that um, teachers are data-driven uh, in the way that they approach their work and they teach to the test in order to generate the statistics uh, that will 
satisfy government and demonstrate to the world outside that they're doing a good job. And there's a kind of double think in this because the teachers know that their good job <laughs> is in terms of the um, personal development and skills development of their students, which can't necessarily be represented by that data. And that is a, a, a very serious concern. SATs were introduced um, in the, following the introduction of the national curriculum and the national curriculum uh, was legislated for in 1988 and came on stream in 1990. Um, the SATs really got going about 1993 and then they really began to um, govern uh, increasingly the way in which teachers taught. Now, uh, the people who were senior administrators and um, politicians at the time um, were um, Chris Woodhead, who was the uh, chief inspector, chief HMI, um, was a great promoter of, um, of, of SATs. And a succession of secretaries of state First of all, in the, um, uh, in, in the Conservative government in the early 1990s, um, Kenneth Clark and uh, John Patton, the two names that came to mind, were very keen on um, the collection of statistics and the measurement of schools' performance in terms of data, which of course was processed by computer. Um, and then when new Labour government came in in 1997, I would say it was David Blunkett, uh, the Secretary of State for Education, who again threw his weight behind that kind of um, accountability, that system of accountability. Um, it's a very difficult question, isn't it? We can't blame the technology. <laughs> um, the technology was there, but the technology led I think politicians and administrators to think in particular ways uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about the measurement of, of school performance. I think what's uh, really exciting now is the fact that we can get very high quality, high definition uh, images of documents, historical documents from museums and that children can consult those in their classroom. Um, and the downside I see with that is that it might deter uh, students and it might deter um, classes and schools from making visits to museums. Actually, I don't think it does. I, I'm, I'm very encouraged when I go to local museums to see that um, despite the fact that we can look at really good quality images of um, artefacts from the past or of maps or of documents on the screen, um, people will still want to go to the museum to see, see the real things in, in the flesh. So I think that that's, um, I, I think on the whole it's benefit. I worry about the, as so many people do, about the sedentary nature of working with a computer and the fact that children uh, you know, spending hours and hours uh, just sat in front of the screen and what's that doing to <laughs> their bodies and um, even their minds um, because, uh, but, but, but on the other hand, the interaction uh, with technology and particularly, you know, the use of mobiles and so on is, is undoubtedly expanding their world and opening up all sorts of uh, different opportunities to them. So it's a real dilemma for, for, for teachers and uh, for those of us who are concerned about education and about the development of young children, I, I, I think we're always sort of weighing up the pros and cons. Um, Museums often use uh, computers interactive um, uh, displays very well, so um, you know they, they, they can actually enhance the museum experience so that you know when you go to the museum you're actually using uh, the, the computers to to improve your understanding of what you're looking at and for children to work together in groups doing that.